place and worship the God of all creation, the King of kings is worthy of our praises. Please remain standing as we continue in worshiping Him. Remain standing before I read God's word. Would you find a couple of people around you, bless them in the name of Jesus and welcome them today. can find yourself settling down all right as you get back to where you were this morning I know we are in our series in the book of Genesis in fact this is the 41st week in this series but I want to begin today's message with a prayer that the psalmist wrote as a start for us the psalmist says in psalm 118 verse 19 open to me the gates of righteousness i shall enter through them i shall give thanks to yah to the lord this is the gate of yahweh the righteous will enter through it i shall give thanks to you for you have answered me and you have become my salvation the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone this is from Yahweh it is marvelous in our eyes this is the day which Yahweh has made let us rejoice and be glad in it O oh, Yahweh save O oh, Yahweh succeed blessed is the one who comes in the name of Yahweh we have blessed you from the house of Yahweh Yahweh is God and he has given us light Amen. would you join me in prayer father we call upon your name we call on the name of Jesus today Holy Spirit would you come and fill this room with your presence in such a mighty way that every man and every woman would experience you in a deep and intimate way today I pray for the words that we read as hard as they may be today in your truth in your scripture that our hearts would not be hardened but that we would see the corruption around us we would see the evil in this world but yet we would proclaim this is the day that the Lord has made yes. and we will rejoice we will be glad in it so Lord today this is your day this is your church and these are your people and we say blessed be the name of Jesus who is going to speak to his people through his word Amen. may our hearts be attentive our minds open our ears open to your truth and may we enter through the gates of righteousness today blessed be your name Jesus in your holy and precious name we pray amen and amen you may be seated good morning everybody how's everybody doing this morning Praise the Lord. Listen, if you have your Bibles, open up to the book of Genesis, chapter 33. We're going to start with verse 18 and go all the way to the end of chapter 34. If you are using your digital devices, please be gracious and kind enough to silence them, turn the media off, switch your Bible translations to the Legacy Standard Bible so that you could be on the same page with us. If you are needing a physical copy of a bible hands all the way up let our ushers see you so they can bring you a copy keep them up until they bring you one now this morning i want to start us right off the bat with our self-examination question for today and i want you to ask yourself this i know i tell you this all the time but again this is important okay i want you to ask yourself do i let corruption dim the light of christ in me I want you to really ask yourself, do you let corruption of this world, the darkness of this world, dim the light of Jesus? We just read in the verse that Yahweh is God, the Lord is God, and He has given us light. Do you let corruption dim that light that God has placed in you? 
about 13 years ago or so as a church, when we were a brand new church back then, we made a decision that we as a church are not going to allow the enemy, Satan, to take away or steal what is God's. Amen. We made a decision that we're going to do whatever it takes to take away or take back what the enemy has stolen. And one of the ways that we decided to do that was, was by going out on October 31st, what the culture calls Halloween. The day that, this, that Satan claims is his day or the culture claims is a day of darkness and evil. And we decided, no, this is the day Yahweh has made. And we will rejoice and we will be glad in it. So we began to the process of saying, okay, how could we do this? So I remember the first year we went out and, and we bought some hot dogs and some drinks. And we had about a couple packages or a few packages of hot dogs, about 100 dogs. And we started giving out hot dogs to people. And somehow over the course of the years, hot dogs have become our source of measurement <laughs> for that. So what has started with 100 hot dogs the next year led to 200 400, 600, 800, and last year we gave about 1,200 hot dogs to the community. And I, and I, I use this, I use this as, a, as a sign to tell you, we said the reason we did this, say we want to go out not to condemn those who walk in the darkness. Not to tell them, hey, you are walking in the darkness of the culture, but we want to go out and we want to tell the world that there is a light in Jesus who can change the darkness and the corruption so that we could shine. And I am telling you today, as we get ready for this again this coming week, for October 31st, to reclaim what the enemy has stolen, don't be like the culture as a church. Don't dress gory costumes. Don't dress like evil. Don't make it look like it is the day of evil. It is the day of the Lord. We're going to take it back, and we're going to begin by that, change the culture gradually, because as a church, we have been given that kind of an authority to change the culture. Now, the reason I start with all of this is because today we're going to talk about corruption quite a bit. In fact, can I be honest with you? Yes, <laughs> Five people in this church want an honest pastor. The rest of you is like, you know what? If I have a dishonest pastor, I could do whatever I want. <laughs> Can I be honest with you? Yeah. You know, there is a reason as we talk about corruption, there is a reason why I choose to preach from the books of the Bible. And it's been 41 weeks as to why we are in the book of Genesis. Because I would never in a million years wake up on a Monday morning and say, I think I want to prepare for a sermon this week on Genesis chapter 34. I just feel like today I should talk about rape, circumcision, mass murder, and slavery. Let's cover all of it in one Sunday. In a million years, I would never come to a passage like this on my own because I too, our leadership, too, we would be prone to the corruption of this world. But that's why we need to have guidelines. That's why we need to say, no, we are here to preach the truth and the whole truth and nothing more and nothing less. This is our job as a church, and today that's what we're going to cover. So here's the thing. You might be excited right now, but you may not find yourself too excited in just a few moments. <laughs> because we're going to talk about a few principles in the Scripture as to for you to test yourself, a few lessons to see whether you are allowing corruption to dim the light of Christ in you by looking at a passage that God is not even in it. So let me ask you this. Anybody excited about God's Word today? Yeah. All right. If you have your Bibles, open up the book of Genesis, chapter 33, verse 18 is where I want to begin. Before I read, last week we covered how Jacob wrestled with God. And as he wrestled with God, God took the beating so that he would be able to make peace with his brother Esau. He and his brother made peace. And today is where we're continuing. After 20 years of conflict between them, they eventually made peace. And Jacob is coming back to the land of his kin. And verse 18 begins by saying, Now Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan. When he came from Paddan Aram and he camped before the city, then he bought a portion of the field where he had pitched his tent from the hand of the sons of, important name, we're going to come to it in a moment, Hamor, another name, Shechem's father, for 100 kista, which is the money that was at the time being used. Then he set up there an altar, and this is the only time you hear a mention of God in the rest of what we're going to read. He set up an altar, and he called it El Elohei Israel. So let me, let me go back. So we are introduced 
to, uh, to two new characters in our story. The first one is a Canaanite man who we're going to find out that these are, this is an important family in the land of Canaan where they are. And he buys a property from them. The father's name is Hamor, which literally translates to donkey. That is the definition of the dude's name, donkey. Okay, donkey. Now, then we are introduced to the name of his son, which means Shechem, which means, which means back or shoulder. So if Shechem is the son of Hamor, so he's the back or the shoulder of the donkey. Okay, now this, I tell you all the time, details matter. Details matter. I'm going to come back to these details eventually. So stay with this. However, let me tell you, they buy a property from them. I don't know about Jacob, but if I was doing negotiation with somebody whose name is Donkey, I would be a little bit weary about it. I'm just saying, I would have reservations. However, he buys a property. He builds up an altar there, and it's the first or the only inclination of God's name being mentioned anywhere. And he calls it El Elohe, not Yahweh, but El Elohe, Israel, which literally translates God, the God of Israel. But if you want a literal de definition, God, the God of him who strives with God. So he builds an altar there. It's as though he is doing an altar, making an altar as a sign of a prophecy of what is about to come. Because for the next, however many verses we are about to read, the next chapter, we are going to see that Jacob's family is going to strive with God and is going to strive with men. Because corruption is going to come so deep in here that some of you may read this and say, I, are we sure we are reading the Bible? Are we sure this is, should be in here? So I'm telling you, some of you, if this may bother some of us what we're about to read. But yet it is in God's word. You still with me? Yes. Chapter 34, verse 1 says, Now Dinah, important detail, the daughter of who? Leah, Leah whom she had born to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Let me pause right here for a moment. We are given two literary clues. I want to set the stage for us, what we're going to get to. Two literary clues. One you notice is Dinah. First, Dinah, the name definition of Dinah, we have talked about her before, but Dinah literally translates to vindicated or judged. That's the definition of her name. Now it says, Dinah, the girl whose name is vindicated or judged, Dinah went out to the daughters of the land, but it says, Dinah, the daughter of Leah. This is the first literary inclination or literary clue that tells you that Jacob did not care so much about Dinah. Now we know from the scripture that Leah had seven kids up to this point, and Dinah was the seventh child of Jacob through his first wife, Leah. We also know that Jacob loved Rachel, but not Leah. So it's very obvious that he's not a good father to his daughter. But then the second clue that you see is that she went out to the daughters of Canaan, to the daughters of the land. Now, now important detail there is if you do a little bit of a math, you find out, now I could be wrong on this, but you find out that Dinah at this point in her life is somewhere between 10 to 18 years of age. So she's a child still. And according to the ancient culture, when a girl were to travel to go see the daughters of the land or see friends, they would always have a chaperone to go with them. But the story seems to point out, as we read further in it, that Dinah is all by herself. Another indication that Jacob is not an attentive father. Now, fathers, if you have daughters and you're not attentive toward your daughters, let me tell you, other people will take notice of them. And the enemy will lurk around to bring destruction upon them. So be careful what you do. Now, let me move on. You're still with me? So it says, as she goes out, verse 2 says, Then Shechem, the back or the shoulder... Okay, the Shechem, uh, the son of Hamor, so the back of shoulder of the donkey, important detail, the Hivite, the prince of the land. So we know that these guys are important people. Saw her, so she Shechem saw her and took her and lay with her and violated her. And he was deeply attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke to the heart of the young woman. So you notice this, that he loved her by raping her. He literally rapes her and says that he loved her. But let me tell you something. What he has is not love, is the notion of love, of wanting to get what you want. When somebody comes and tells you, I love you to get what they want, they're going to keep on pushing you and violating you until they constantly get what they want. So what he has is not real love. In fact, if you're a note taker, what I want you to write down, lesson number one, one of the ways we can determine corruption in our lives is corruption assumes evil desires as a right to obtain. 
if you are a corrupted person, you push people out of your way. That's what you do. You push people, you crush people, all, you do all of this to get what you want. That's what corrupted people do. And that's one way of testing yourself. See that, are you a corrupted person? Now listen, by raping Dinah, Shechem guarantees for himself that no other man would ever touch her according to the standards of the culture. So he goes against the cultural norms by doing something corrupted and immoral by raping her. Now listen, I, I, I want to, can I, I'm going to offend a few people. Can I offend a few people? Is that okay? It's okay. You can put on your big boy, big girl pants on for a moment, okay? Because if we don't talk about this right here, where else would you hear it? I realize that the culture says today that sex outside of marriage is okay. I realize that the culture says that you should try the people before you marry them to make sure that it's going to work out sexually. But I'm telling you, the culture is a corrupted and deceitful culture. And I'm standing here before you telling you, if you're a person who cohabitates, who has sex outside of marriage, who try out one another, you are no different than a person who is violating the other person for the sake of getting what you want. That is exactly vi what violation is, violating somebody else. You don't love them. It is the notion of love. If you genuinely love them, you can still fix things. Be celibate, propose, do it the right way. Right. Do it the way it is intended to be. Don't yeah. violate one another because if you do violate, it's not going to essentially work out. Corruption always leads to more corruption. That's what it does. Good. You still with me? Yeah. All right, so verse, verse 4, so Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, get me this girl as a wife. Now Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter, but his sons ran with his livestock in the fields. So Jacob kept silent until they came in. Another indication, Jacob simply doesn't care about Dinah. He kept silent. He said, let my sons deal with it. Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with them. Now the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very angry because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel the first time you hear the, the nation of Israel mentioned as a nation in the Bible. By laying with Jacob's daughter for such a thing ought not to be done. They're saying hey, this, this, this should not happen. Raping somebody should not be a normal thing. It should not be a cultural thing. This should not take place. This is not a normal thing. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but listen number two if you are note takers. Corruption tries to find an easy way out of consequences. Did you notice what Shechem does? Father, go take me this daughter. Now, also it is implied that Hamor and Shechem are not too afraid of Jacob and his family. They don't see him as a threat. So after raping her, they say, hey, let's go smooth things out. We will go offer him whatever we want. We will try to buy her or try to buy our sin uh, uh, so in one way or another. And I'm telling you, that's what corruption does. Corruption says, maybe I can find an easy way out of the consequences of life, out of the consequences of my sins and my mistakes. But I'm standing before you telling you this. That also doesn't work. Consequences of your mistakes are a necessity. That's why God does not always take him away. Because it reminds you that you should not repeat the same things over and over and over again and fall for the same traps of darkness. In fact, Jesus spoke to his disciples about the consequence of sin. And I don't think it gets any harsher than this. He says in Mark chapter 9, verse 43, And if your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. That's a consequence. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire. So there has to be a consequence for sins. So the Shechem and his father come and say, maybe we can smooth this out. Now we do the same thing. We, we sin and then we say, maybe if I can go to church today, God will not only forgive me, take away the consequence. God, I will give you 20 bucks today. Would you remove the consequence? The hearts that are so corrupted and so wretched that we don't even know that we are defiling God's temples. You still with me? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the number of responses are getting less. <laughs> Verse 8. But Hamor, the donkey, spoke with them, saying, by the way, this just came to me, but this is another talking donkey. We have another talking donkey in the Bible, but this is a different one. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, the soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife and intermarry with us. 
Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Thus you shall live with us, and the land shall be open before you. Live and trade in it and take positions of property in it. And Shechem also said to her father and to the brothers, If I find favor in your sight, how could you find favor when you have raped the daughter? Then I will give whatever you say, you say to me. Ask me ever so much bridal payments and gift, and I will give according to you, according as you say to me. But give me the girl as a wife. Now, listen. Number three: corruption is convinced that there there are benefits to its presence. Corruption is convinced that there is a benefit to its presence. Now, let me put it like this: You remember. When Jesus was being tempted, Satan took him and said, if you bow down and worship me, I will give you all of this. That's what corruption does. If you intermarry with us, you can have all this land. Yet the thing is, Isaac, the father of Jacob, had already made a commandment to Jacob saying, make sure you don't take any of the daughters of the land of Canaan. Genesis chapter 28, verse 1. So Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and commanded him and said to him, you shall not take your wife from the daughters of Canaan. So they already know this marriage is not going to work out. Yeah. They already know this is not something that is honorable. Along with that, the daughter has been raped in the culture. That is not an acceptable thing. Yeah. And it should not be acceptable in any culture. So the evil presence, the corruption says, but we can still benefit from each other. Now think about it. What does corruption tell you? If you have sex with so-and-so, there's a benefit to it. What do, what do drugs tell you? If you don't use me, you're going to suffer. Corruption convinces you that there's benefits to his presence. You've got to be weary. Verse 13, but Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father, Hamor, with... I, I wonder where they learned that from. If you have read your Bibles, remember what Jacob means? The supplanter, the deceiver. And thus they spoke because he had defiled Dinah, their sister. And they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised. For that would be a reproach to us. Only on this condition will be consent to you. If you will become like us in that every male among you be circumcised. Then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughter for ourselves, and we will live with you, and you become one, one, one people with you. But if you will not listen to us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter, and we will go. So they say, Jacob's son say, you know what? We have learned from our father how deceiving other people works. So let's deceive these guys. If you become circumcised, now what a condition. If you become circumcised, we will give you our daughters and we will marry with you. Now, these are all cultural things taking place. And they, they convince them, hey, this is the way that we can intermarry and work with you. Because lesson number four, if you're note takers, corruption sells deception as discretion. Corruption always sells deception as discretion. That's exactly what politicians do. They come and tell you, if you vote for me. I will change the nation. Yeah? Four years later, it hasn't changed. If you vote for me, I will change the city. Choose me to be the mayor. Choose me to be the sheriff. Choose me to be the judge. Choose me. If you do these kind of things, I don't want to take into politics. This is not a political message. But corruption always sells itself as discretion. That's why... The unweary people, the, the, those who are not paying attention to the condition of their souls, realizing that God has called us to be a light, what we do is we give ear to that corruption. And we say, maybe they will indeed change. Maybe they will do what they say. Maybe. Instead of trusting God, we begin to trust the corrupted world around us. But it says in Psalm 52, verse 2 through 4, says, Your tongue devises destruction like a sharp razor, O worker of deceit. You love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. You love all words that devour, O oh, deceitful tongue. Corruption sells itself as discretion, but all of it is deceit and evil. I'm getting close. Are you still with me? Yes. You sure? You sure? Okay, verse 18. Now their words seemed good in the sight of Hamor and Shechem. How could circumcision sound like a good idea? I... I now, their words seemed good to the sight of Shechem and Hamor's son. And so young, the young man, 
Shechem did not delay to do this, the thing because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. He is only thinking in the flesh. Now he was more honored than all the household of his father. So Hamor and his, and, and his son Shechem came to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city, saying, These men are peaceful with us. Therefore let them live in the land and trade in it. For behold, the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters for us as wives and give our daughters to them. Only on this condition will the men consent to us to live with us, to become one people that every male among us be circumcised as they are circumcised. Now watch this. Will not their livestock and what they acquire and all their cattle be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will live with us. And all who went out of the gates of his city listened to Hamor and to his son Shechem. And every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of the city. They all listened. I don't know about you guys, but if somebody came and told me, here's the condition, man. You could be rich. You could have this. You could have... Here's the condition. You got to go circumcised and make sure the whole church is circumcised. I'll be like, What? <laughs> if a politician stands before you and tells you, here's how we're going to change the nation, all of you go get circumcised, what would you do? <laughs> Yet these guys are so honorable in the culture, so respected. The cor see, the, the corruption has taken such toll. They are so honorable, so respected in the culture that as they say these words, now listen, these are Canaanite people. They are not under the, the covenant of Abraham which said, God said to Abraham, be circumcised. Circumcise your children. They are not under no obligation to undergo with this, but yet they fall for it because, listen, number five, corruption incites the snare of death upon the unsuspecting. Now, we're going to see this in a moment. But corruption brings the trap, the snare of death upon those who are not focused, who don't re oh, forget to pray, God, lead me to the gates of your righteousness. That's what corruption does. In fact, um, let me read the rest. You, you still with me? Yeah. We're getting close. Verse 25. Now, it happened on the third day. So these guys are all circumcised. When they were in pain, that two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came upon the city and killed every male mass murder oh well that's something god would have wanted <laughs> what are they thinking they killed everybody and they killed hamor and his son shechem with the edge of the sword and took dinah from shechem's house and went away Jacob's sons came upon the slain and plundered the city. And because they, had, because they had defiled their sister, they took their flocks and their herds and their donkeys and that which was in the city and that which was in the field. And they captured and plundered all their wealth. And watch this. And all their little ones and their wives, even all that was in the houses. They turned an act of corruption into an act of vengeance that led to mass murder and slavery. Because here's what corruption does. Listen, number six, if you're a note takers, corruption responds to injustice with injustice. It will never be. You will never see corruption respond to just, injustice with justice. It will never happen. Yet the scripture is filled with instances telling you, don't be like the world. Don't, when somebody cusses at you, don't cuss back at them. When somebody mistreats you, don't be like them. Be different. Don't respond to injustice with injustice. That's exactly what corruption and Satan wants you to do. In fact, it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 19, verse 7, it says, So now then, let the dread of Yahweh, the dread of the Lord be upon you. Let the dread of Yahweh be upon you and be careful what you do because with Yahweh, our God, there is no unrighteousness or partiality or taking of a bribe. So don't come and say, I believe in God, but yet corruption is taking over your heart. Don't come and say, I believe in God, but yet when somebody cusses at you, you cuss right back at them. When somebody does injustice, you pay them back with injustice. Don't do that because that's a sign that you are a corrupted person. So then I'm going to finish with this. 
Verse 30, so then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, I want you to notice this though. Jacob said to Simeon to Levi, you have brought trouble on me. Are you with me for a moment? Yeah. You have brought trouble on me by making me. odious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. Go to the next slide. And my, my men being few in number, they will gather together against me. and a strike and I will be destroyed, and I and my household. But they said, should he treat our sister as a harlot? And the story ends. <laughs> and then, I'm not kidding you. Then you go to the next chapter. It's a brand new story, a brand new section of, of uh, timeline and story. And it's, what just happened? But Jacob's response to all of this is, my, son, my daughter has been raped. My sons have committed mass murder. They have learned from me to be deceitful. They have committed mass murder. They have taken slaves. And his response is, See what you have done to me? It's all about me, 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 me. You have brought trouble upon me and my household, and now I'm going to be in trouble. Corruption turns everything about me. That's what it does. <laughs> now, the story ended, and you say, hold on a second. I think a few weeks ago when it was Doug who was preaching, he said, every word of the Scripture leads to Jesus. <laughs> Where is he? Where is Jesus in this story? Where, where is Yahweh in this story? Where is the Lord in this story? Well, the thing is, sometimes you have to see the reality of the condition of the hearts of man to be able to see that man desperately needs a Savior. Amen. Yeah. Desperately. In fact, we just read through the story where rape led to wanting to get rid of the consequences of sin, making negotiations about how to smooth sin, deceiving one another, leading to circumcision, and leading to murder, mass murder, and leading to kidnapping and slavery. And then at the end, story ending with just a mere selfishness that, see what you have done to me. But you know what is amazing? We learned also, and I, I want to take you, I, want, I will finish in a moment, but I don't want to add anything to the scripture. But if you're looking at where is Jesus in this story, I want to give you for a moment, what I'm about to give you, it's Nasser's perspective theology. So don't, don't go and quote it and say, this is what God says. But my mind, the way it sees, I try to pay attention to some details and I mentioned to you, did you know, remember that Hamor means donkey? And Shechem means back or shoulder. So Shechem is the son of Hamor, so he's the back or the shoulder of the donkey. And Dinah means vindicated or judged, but yet the story does not seem in any way to point out that Dinah found any vindication in the story. And most likely her life was ruined for the rest of her existence. Her father didn't care for her. Her brothers did not deal with the whole situation the way they should have. Dinah is the one who needed the vindication. But where is this vindication? Because here's the thing. When the donkey of immorality attacks, you have to ask yourself the question, what am I going to do with it? Am I going to let this donkey run like a wild donkey in arrogance, in bitterness, in evil? Or am I going to try to deal with the corruption of it? And there's a story in the Bible, a fulfillment of a prophecy. I don't have this on the screen, so the verse is not going to be on the screen, but I will mention it to you. Zechariah 9, 9 talks about the Savior of the world coming riding on a donkey, on the back of a donkey. And then you get to the Gospels. All the four Gospels mention this instance that the Savior, the Messiah, entered through the gates of Jerusalem, riding on the back of a donkey in control of the corruption and the evil and the brokenness, saying, I have come to save the city, to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, to bring vindication. And it says in John chapter 12, verse 14 through 15, and Jesus finding a young donkey sat on it as it is written fear not daughter of zion behold your king is coming seated on a donkey's colt so you want to know how to get rid of corruption the only way is if jesus rides on top of it 
There is no other way. See, sometimes you and I, we think that we can go head to head with the donkey. That we can, we can attack this donkey and we can face the donkey. The donkey acts like a donkey. It doesn't know any better. Corruption doesn't know any better. But if you have a king who sits on it, then the king can guide every step of that corruption. And he can make sure that the donkey would enter the city but not harm the people of God. That is what Jesus does. And that is the question we ask ourselves today. Will I let the corruption of this world dim the light of Christ in me? Or will I allow Jesus, the Savior of the world, do what he does best? Sitting on the back and the shoulder of that donkey, guiding it and steering it away from his church, from his people. Leading his church to become a place where people say, this is the day Yahweh the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Blessed is he who comes in the name of Yahweh. So in a moment, we're going to celebrate with communion. But here's your chance, your opportunity to test your hearts, to see has corruption entered so deep that you don't even know it? And today is a day to say, Jesus, I want you to take a control of it. This wild donkey in me, this wild animal in me is causing so much chaos, and I have lost sight of it. So if the Holy Spirit leads you to pray, kneel with me, kneel with me on your seats up here. If the Holy Spirit leads you to raise your hands or to bow your heads, feel free to do that. Our Jesus, our Savior, we bless your name today. Blessed is our God who loves us and guides us and teaches us. Blessed are you, O Lord, that guide us into your righteousness. And today we pray as the psalmist prayed, leads us to the gates of righteousness. Lord, let our mouths, our hearts constantly praise the name of the Lord. Otherwise, Lord, we will find ourselves entangled with corruption. Fallen into the hands of deception and evil. We will see the donkey attack. We will see that we will give in and we will attack back. We will retaliate. But with you, Jesus, we can make sure that you are the Savior. That you are the Redeemer. You are the hope. And we would not rely on our own justice, on our own understanding, but trust in the fact that our God reigns today. And Lord, this week, as the devil has claimed so much this week, in the name of Jesus, the Savior of the world, we will go out and we will say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And Satan, you will have no authority in it. We will proclaim that in the name of Jesus. And we will give you our adoration, Lord. We will give you our praise, Jesus. We will call upon you, and we will see you change the culture one person at a time. Blessed be your name, Lord. I pray all of these in your holy and precious name, Jesus.